Coming up, a seminary inside a prison cell. This is my mission field. Plus, a killer headache that left doctors stumped. I just gave up on that. Watch what finally brought her relief. I haven't had any pain since. And then, they're called Lost Kites, abandoned children fighting for life. Now, meet one filmmaker who wants to bring them home on today's 700 Club. It has been said, ladies and gentlemen, that whatever the Clintons touch turns dirty. They have corrupted, in my opinion, the FBI, a, a formerly a honorable, wonderful service, and the, the people who work there are appalled. Do you realize a general, a major general, just got convicted of leaking uh, classified information, not even a a fraction of what Hillary Clinton did. But the WikiLeaks keep leaking, and the truth is out. But are the American people paying any attention to it? Well, it's one that seems to have gotten everybody's attention, where an agent says, OK, what I want you to do, this is the FBI guy, is saying, uh, you take subpoenaed documents that are already on a subpoena, and I want you to change something is from the classification, you know, from uh, top secret to, to, you know, a lower classification. And they said, in order to do that, what we'll do to the FBI, the, the State Department man said, well, we'll give you uh, nice vacations or um, beach uh, bungalow or something. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And they call it quid pro quo. And in addition, we have irrefutable evidence. <laughs> yeah, more indications. More indications. More indications that the media is favoring Hillary Clinton in the race for the White House. Shocker, right? Well, Heather Sells brings us that story. FBI files released Monday show just last year a top State Department official trying to cover up a Benghazi email on Hillary Clinton's private server. It happened during the FBI investigation into her email scandal. Under Secretary of State Patrick Kennedy, an ally of Hillary Clinton, offered the FBI a quid pro quo to change the email classification so that it wouldn't be seen. The FBI eventually said no, and the FBI and State Department deny any deal. The political fallout, Republicans say the Obama administration was working to protect Clinton. This is worse than Watergate, what's going on with this. And what does she get out of it? She gets to run for the presidency of the United States. Explain that. Explain that. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's wife, Melania, is speaking out about the videotape from 2005 where he made lewd comments about women. She told CNN that her husband is not that kind of man. He was lead on, like uh, egg on from uh, the host to say um, dirty and bad stuff. And new charges against the media. It turns out that the overwhelming majority of donations from journalists have gone to Hillary Clinton. Federal campaign finance filings show working media have given $382,000 to Clinton. And they gave just 14000 to Trump. A new WikiLeaks release also confirms concerns about media collusion with the Democratic Party. Glenn Thrush, a White House political correspondent with the website Politico, emailed Clinton's campaign chair John Podesta, asking him to review a story before it was published, saying, please don't share or tell anyone I did this. The campaign media revelations are just the latest in a year filled with them, and they come with just three weeks till the election and one day until the final debate. Heather Sells, CBN News. You know, ladies and gentlemen, don't you get horrified? I mean, you'd think the American people, they, you know, Rush Limbaugh calls them a drive-by, the people who don't pay much attention. But surely there's been so much that people, they, they must be sickened. They, they, they must, you know, say we've got to have honesty in our, in our uh, system and to have a State Department man offering a bribe essentially to an FBI uh, agent and to, to um, change a classification on a subpoenaed document. 
for the average person, that would be 20 years in the slammer, big time. There wouldn't be any question about it. For Hillary, it's, it's, a, it's a pass. They're not going to do it. For her people, they're not going to do it. They lie, and they, they collude, and they uh, withhold evidence. And then you look back to Lois Lerner and her crowd at the IRS. Finally, it looks like the IRS uh, is changing things uh, under the pressure from organizations like the American Center for Law and Justice. And a federal judge uh, has uh, ordered the IRS to finally deal with the applications for tax-exempt status from grassroots conservative groups. That's just one more scandal. John Jessup has that. That's right, Pat. The tax agency has been under investigation for targeting conservative groups and holding up their applications, in some cases, for years. District Judge Reggie Walton has ruled the IRS must make decisions on those outstanding applications by November 11th. The American Center for Law and Justice represents 38 groups suing the IRS. Chief Counsel Jay Sekulow called the judge's order a major victory, pointing out it will be seven years this December since one of the ACLJ's clients first submitted its application and another group has waited for six and a half years. Well, in Iraq, Kurdish forces paused today in the new offensive to retake Mosul from ISIS. Peshmerga forces needed additional time to gain a stronger hold on nearby villages they captured Monday. The pause comes one day after intense fighting involving airstrikes, heavy artillery, and ISIS car bombs. As Chris Mitchell reports, the military campaign against ISIS is just the start of a much larger battle over control of Iraq's second largest city. The sounds of battle surrounded Mosul as Iraqi and Kurdish forces launched their push into the city. Kurdish fighters seen here have captured at least seven villages just outside Mosul. The Kurdish Peshmerga seem eager to help free the city. Today, you know, we're going to fight until we die. The enemy has clearly shown it's ready to die. This ISIS suicide bomber blew himself up after driving into this Iraqi tank. Iraqi and Kurdish forces are receiving help from the 101st Airborne and U.S. airstrikes. U.S. commanders pledge a difficult but successful conflict. This may prove to be a long and tough battle, but the Iraqis have prepared for it, and we will stand by them. The Iraqi security forces and the coalition are not only fighting for the future of Iraq, we are fighting to ensure the security of all of our nations. But the various forces trying to capture Mosul hold different agendas. That wrinkle raises the question, who controls Mosul when the battle is over? That's a good question. Mm. That is the question, what happens after the fall of Mosul? Retired U.S. Colonel Richard Knapp told CBN News the military campaign is just the beginning. The critical part is afterwards. You can take Mosul militarily. I think that's the easier piece in my view. It's the part about uh, the political solutions afterwards that need to be meaningful. While the future of Mosul remains unclear, the ISIS dream of a caliphate is crumbling. Their recent loss of the symbolic town of Dabik means ISIS needs a new storyline. According to Islamic prophecy, Dabik was to be the site of an end time battle. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Pat, some major setbacks for ISIS. Well, it's about time. <clears throat> they only have a few uh, thousand people all together, and they have a, probably a few hundred left in, in Mosul. Uh, they've uh, bugged out of that city some uh, uh, months ago, and they're uh, locating back into Syria. Um, we, the thing of what we're concerned about, though, if the government of Iraq takes over Mosul, what that will be conceived as is a victory for Iran, because these people are primarily Shias. Now you've got the Shia-Sunni conflict all going on, and it hasn't been resolved at all. And my solution, frankly, ladies and gentlemen, I know it doesn't comport with United States policy, but I really think Iraq should be taken apart uh, according to the various uh, interests. There's one group that uh, are the wonderful Kurds, they deserve a country. Uh, the uh, Sunnis deserve an enclave that is theirs, and the Shias deserve whatever they ought to have. And I think uh, the, the Iraq, as it stands now, is a creature probably of the, the Brits, probably something Winston Churchill put together when he was Home Secretary. 
And I think it's time to let it come apart. The same thing with Syria. That was a creature of the French. And right now we've got uh, the Alawites, maybe 15% of the total population, controlling the rest of it. And you've got bitter fighting with the Shias, and you've got bitter fighting with the Sunnis. And now the uh, Russians have come in. We have allowed, we have allowed Russia to have a major presence in the Middle East, which they didn't have before. That is the legacy of Barack Obama. That's where it came from. And we are going to bear the consequence as they talk now, I'm actually, they've talked about thermonuclear war, if you could imagine anything as horrible as that. And the Russians are rattling sabers and saying, we want to, you know, force you to do this, that, and the other. Well, John has more on that. John? That's right, Pat. As you just mentioned with Syria, government officials in Moscow say Russia and Syria will stop airstrikes on the city of Aleppo. Russian forces and the Syrian army plan to observe what's being called a humanitarian pause for eight hours this Thursday. At that time, Syrian rebels, including al-Qaeda militants, as well as the sick and the wounded, will be allowed to leave. And as George Thomas reports, this serves as a reminder of Russia's growing influence in the region in just the last couple of years. The mayor of Aleppo says what's happening to his besieged city is a holocaust. We live a daily holocaust in Aleppo. Aleppo is burning every day. Nearly 400 people, mainly civilians, have died in Aleppo since Syrian government forces, backed by Russian warplanes, launched an all-out offensive to retake control of the city last month. The U.S. has accused both countries of committing war crimes. But Russia's president shot back, insisting his forces are targeting al-Qaeda-linked militants who are using civilians as human shields. Unfortunately, whenever military operations take place, innocent people suffer and die. But we cannot allow terrorists to hide among civilians. We cannot allow them to blackmail the entire world when they take hostages, kill or behead people. The UN is now warning that if the bombardment doesn't stop, Aleppo will completely be destroyed by Christmas. So the appeal I want to launch is, let's stop this massacre. Let's save the population of Aleppo. It's never too late to make peace. Meanwhile, Russia's military influence in Syria just got stronger. The Kremlin approved a deal that keeps its forces in the war-torn country indefinitely. Ratification of the agreement is in the key interests of Russia, which is fighting against international terrorism. Russia's brutal air campaign has reversed the tide of war, allowing Syria's president Bashar al-Assad's forces to regain lost territory. Moscow claims the goal has always been about helping the Syrian army fight against radical Islamic forces. The Kremlin has long insisted that it has wanted to avoid a Libya-like scenario taking place in Syria, where the government was overthrown and that allowed elements of the Islamic State to gain a foothold. But while Russia says it's fighting Islamic terrorism, Moscow's dominance in the Middle East is on the rise. Two years ago, Russia barely had a military presence in the region. Now experts say its fighter jets and missiles are flying over Syrian, Iranian and Iraqi airspace. George Thomas, CBN News, Moscow. Thanks, George. Well, here at home, Hurricane Matthew was the first major hurricane to hit America in a decade and left in its wake billions of dollars in damages. As Andrew Knox reports, Operation Blessing is offering much-needed help as people rebuild. Yes. As cleanup from Hurricane Matthew continues in the hard-hit communities of Fayetteville, North Carolina, Susan Johnson struggles to put her life back together after the terrifying ordeal. I was very frightened. I I, I started to panic and my husband was trying to calm me down because by that time I thought we should have gone to the evacuation center, but it was too late. Just to give you an idea of the power of Hurricane Matthew in this community, behind the Johnson's house is this creek, which is at least 20 feet below me. But the water level easily would rise over my head where I'm standing right now, up these patio steps. The Johnson's home is 25 feet to my right. The water line on their home after the storm was four feet high. We were just totally did not expect that, to be sitting in your house at night and water coming up, you know, from the floor up. The damage left by the floodwaters was overwhelming. My husband and I were turning in circles, basically. Um, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what to do next. And I turned my head and 
these two come walking up and they tell me who they're from. And, and I just told them, I said, you know, it's just a blessing because I watch Pat Robson every day and pray with him and um, I see Operation Blessing. So when I heard Susan's story, she's legally blind. Her and her husband are older. They're by themselves. They need people to come help her. And so when I heard that, we had a sense of volunteers over this way. Operation Blessing was able to help the Johnsons begin the long road to recovery. The Lord is good. He always provides. He has a plan. I know there's a plan in this. It just means the world to me. And Pat, people like the Johnsons and many others will need help for quite some time. Well, it's a thrill to me that we can help people like that. I, I didn't know that dear lady, but God bless her. And the fact that she is one of our viewers and that we were then able to have relief coming to her home. Uh, we do what we can. And uh, there's a lot of problems in our, there are a lot of problems in our world and we, we're there to help where we can. So if you want to participate, you know, you never know what life you may save. And the address is easy to remember, Operation Blessing. And the number to call is 807, that's the toll, to, to, for the toll free, is 707,000. Or you can log on to CBN.com and Disaster Relief. There's so many things we're doing. So if you want to help, we, we're doing it. But folks, this world is in chaos. And we need the prayer of God's people like never before. We need prayer for this nation. There's no question about it. God is doing something. The Spirit of the Lord is moving upon this world. But it's right now going through a period of chaos. And the principal arbiter of the difficulties in our world has been the United States of America. But now we are in the hands of people who don't think that's important. Well, I do. And I know many of you do as well. Terry? Well, up next, they're getting a Bible degree behind bars. So the idea is basically to change the culture by changing the heart with the message of the gospel. And it's had some amazing results in other prisons as well. You'll see it in action when we return. Well, one of the most exciting parts of my broadcast experience took place in a maximum security prison in Rayford, Florida. And we did a show called Maximum Security. It was something else, powerful. Well, they're maximum security inmates. And they're earning, interestingly enough, Bible degrees behind bars. Now, that's the result of a unique partnership between Texas prisons and Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Get that. And Charlene Aaron discovered the goal is to reform the nation's biggest prison system by softening hardened criminals one heart at a time. Watch this. 30 miles out of Houston, Darrington Prison houses some of the nation's most violent offenders. This is a maximum security prison. And we have all custody levels here at this facility. But behind these walls, hardcore criminals are transformed into messengers of hope, thanks to a program offered by Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. It's designed for undergraduate students to receive a Bible college degree to prepare them for pastoral ministry. The first two years, student inmates take general education courses including English, math, and science. Then comes two years of theological training and pastoral ministries. The idea for the seminary came in 2010, when Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and Senator John Whitmire visited Louisiana's Angola prison, where a similar Bible program helped change the prison's long culture of violence. Angola was the bloodiest prison in America. Since the Bible College has come there, They've reduced their crime inside the prison by 72%. So the idea is basically to, to change the culture by changing the heart with the message of the gospel. Serving a life sentence, 54-year-old Troop Foster found his life radically transformed after time in solitary confinement. I was thinking about suicide. I was thinking about ending my life. 
but I remembered the Jesus from my childhood. So I got down on my knees and I cried out to God, please, if you're here, you're going to have to carry me. And from that point forward, he revealed himself to me. Foster, a former gang member, became one of the seminary's first graduates. He now ministers to other hardened gang members. And I went back to started walking those lines and just sharing my testimony with the men back there. And some of them were real standoffish at first, but when I explained to them, look, brother, I've been in, I've been in that cage. I spent eight years where you're at, and I do it in love. And I've had, I've had men come to know Jesus Christ. Brandon Warren serves as a seminary professor. The demographic that we have, some of these guys, um, it's been 20 years since they were in school. Uh, and when they were in school, it wasn't that great of an education. So I teach how to write a research paper, how to write a book review, memorization skills, study habits, um, things like that, uh, to try and bridge that gap. Nearly 60 inmates have completed seminary here at Darrington Prison. And while academics are the major focus of the program, it's the spiritual transformations that make all the difference. Our purpose is to not only give them a theological education, but to pass on from faculty member to student our heart for ministry, for the Bible, uh, for the love of Jesus, and for the love of their inmates. Inmate Vondre Cash is serving a 45-year sentence. Despite not being very religious, he felt drawn to the program. I was searching. Um, I had doubts about Christianity before I came to the program. I had doubts about religion, period. But when I came to the program, the, the love that the professors showed for me, the care and the patience that they showed, and not only them, but also the other students. That love led Cash into a more intimate relationship with God. As a graduate of the Bible College, he now shares the hope he found with others. Being able to, to dialogue with men uh, on a spiritual level, t talk with them in Bible studies, talk with them in prayer circles. Uh, that is rewarding in and of itself. Warren, who once served time, says the program's impact is far-reaching. This is one that happens all the time. Guards asking our students to pray for them uh, or coming to them, you know, about some biblical question they have about the Bible or Scripture. Uh, so that sort of thing has happened from the beginning. Warden Mark Jones also sees the difference. It helps calm down what's going on here at this facility. And even when these offenders graduate and when they go to other facilities, it helps out a lot. Graduates are dispatched to prisons across Texas and live among the general population, where they hope to encourage fellow inmates to change their ways. Foster, who will be almost 80 before he's eligible for parole, says it's his life's purpose to serve others, whether in or outside prison walls. Some people graduate college and seminary and uh, they go to North Africa or uh, Czechoslovakia or Russia with their mission field. This is my mission field. And it's a mission field I've already adapted to the culture here. Uh, this is a mission field I know, I know the language and God's called me here. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Rocheron, Texas. What a wonderful thing. I tell you, that that's, I've been in a lot of those prisons. I don't say a lot of them, a number of them. We've, we've had literacy programs and programs, I think maybe Angola, I'm not sure, but you know, we've seen them and, and you love those guys when you, you know, you, they're, they're, they're criminals. Sometimes they've done one bad thing and they wind up getting 20, 30 years. I think the whole prison thing has got to be reformed. We, we need to have a whole new concept of what we do with people who break laws. Uh, it, and putting somebody in, in, in a lockup for 40, 50 years, I mean, how does that help anybody? I mean, there's something we've got to do that's different. And um, I, I don't think we've come to the solution we need yet. But yeah. this is the first step. And I congratulate the Southwestern Bible Seminary for what they're doing. Southwestern Baptist Seminary, excuse me. Right. Well, and then they need jobs when they exactly. are released. Yeah. So that's yeah. another yeah. area that needs addressing. They, they need somebody yeah. to go along beside them and help them, you know, a mentor and a, and a friend mm -hmm. over the years. The church, yes. Okay. Well, up next, a mom who suffered from crippling migraines for 10 years. 
I'd have little flashes of light and I couldn't see. Mine mimicked strokes and so I couldn't communicate and I would have paralysis and part of my body for a few minutes. See how she was supernaturally healed while she was watching TV. Well, welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club. A little bit of a news item, by the way. Donald Trump's campaign has notified Regent University that they would like to hold a uh, rally on the campus of Regent University. When is that happening? It's Saturday. This, this coming sa Saturday? This, the, this week, this Saturday at 3 p.m. And everybody's invited. The public's invited. It'll be a big rally. Wow, I guess so. Timely. Well, I would think yeah. it's, <laughs> it'd be better to do it now than yeah, wait, than wait later, a couple yeah. of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> right. but I think it might be interesting. And, you know, it's amazing. How these universities have held these debates, Hofstra College and St. Louis University, various ones. And um, so I think it's a, it's a nice thing for colleges to expose their students to the, the, the political thinking of the world they live in. So that's something that's going to come up. But everybody's invited, from what I understand, everybody. And so 3 o'clock on Saturday. Be there, be square, right? It's outside, yeah. Well, it's an outside. Oh, it's outside. Yeah, it's Wonderful. outside. So it, plenty of room for a lot of people. Great. Well, for 10 years, Terry Vardaman lived with excruciating migraines. That's 10 years of pain, 10 years of fear, 10 years of feeling as if she was going through the motions of life. And then one night, Terry was miraculously healed. Right in her home, the migraines vanished. The pain would be behind my eyes, and it would be just really severe, like a clenching pain. It would just be hard to concentrate and hard to uh, just do my normal everyday things. For 10 years, Terry Vardaman suffered from weekly headaches that lasted up to 12 hours at a time. Sometimes I would be nauseous and it just affected everything. At the time I had three kids, I was homeschooling and you just have to get up and keep going. Sometimes the headaches became debilitating migraines. The migraines I would get, it's called like the classical aura. I couldn't see, I'd have little flashes of light and there'd be parts of my vision field I couldn't see. Mine mimicked strokes and so I couldn't communicate and I would have paralysis and part of my body for a few minutes. Terry's doctor wasn't able to determine the cause of her headaches. Nobody ever found anything. None of the medication really worked, so I just gave up on that. I just a lot of times felt like I was on the sidelines, you know, of life. I would kind of go through the motions of things, but it was just hard to be fully engaged. Desperate for relief, Terry studied the Bible to learn about healing. I learned a lot more about the healing scriptures and that Jesus paid for that also on the cross. And I just learned a lot of God's word, but also just comfort and pressing into God, you know, during the hard times. Even though Terry's headaches persisted, she kept praying and believing for a miracle. One night, she and her husband turned on the television. I had a headache at the time, and it was really severe, and probably one of the reasons I couldn't sleep. And so we were in the bed watching the 700 Club, and... Someone else, you have excruciating headaches. I, I don't know if they'd be diagnosed as migraines, but you'll know it's you. The pain is like right behind your eyes, and it just almost makes you feel like your eyes are throbbing when you have this, and it's recurring. God is healing that right now. The pain is gone, and you'll not have them again. I thought, okay, this is me, especially when she gave the word about the migraines too, because that was extra confirmation that it was, it was me. The next day, it was hardly anything at all, but still a little residuals. 
And then uh, after that, I haven't had any pain since. It was almost like, wow, it's here finally after all this time. And uh, it was just a blessing to not have to worry. You know, am I gonna get up tomorrow with a headache? No. Terry's faith is stronger than ever, and she encourages others to keep trusting God in the midst of trial. One of his names is Elroy, the God who sees me, and, and that's what I kept thinking was, you know, you see me, thank you that you see me, and he is faithful, and he will do what he promises. Ten years of horror, isn't that fantastic? Yeah. Here is something, too, ter uh, you, you've had quite a row. <laughs> this is Sidney of Aurora, Colorado, who had been battling with blisters who were under his left eyelid. Mm. Uh, he'd been to several doctors, including especially, nothing was working. One day he was watching this program and you said, quote, you have the recurring problem with blisters under the lids of your eyes. And uh, Sidney couldn't believe it. And uh, he says, uh, this is the exact problem, that within a day, the blisters were gone, and he had not returned since. Isn't you know, it? Doesn't that just remind you of what she said? I, El, El Roy, I am the God who sees you. That, that's I mean, right. He knows he you. Sees you. He knows your need. He knows he your name. Knows. This is Anthony, who lives in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. He suffered with severe back pain. He was watching this program when a story aired of a woman who was healed of the same problem he had. Then we prayed. Pat, you had a word of knowledge of someone being healed of back pain. He claimed the word. He he said he was healed instantly and has not had a bit of trouble, from severe back pain yeah. to no trouble at all. God is able. Listen, when God created the world, how did he do it? He spoke. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible says. And God said, let there be light. And God said, let the earth come forth and team with the animals. God spoke it and it came into being. God, through his spirit, will put into the mouth of people, not just special people sitting on television, but people who love him all over the world. And as you speak the word, the power of God is present to bring forth miracles. Now, that's what we want to see. And uh, before we pray for the everybody, uh, probably, in my opinion, the most outstanding evangelist in the history of the world that's a big statement, is my friend Reinhard Bonnke. He has preached to millions and millions of people. He has seen miracles extraordinary. Reinhard has a tumor in his throat, mm. and he's going in for surgery today. And so uh, he, some of you, he may have already had the surgery, and it's in the process of having it. I don't know exactly what the time frame is. But we're going to pray, pray for him and pray for you. God is able. There's nothing impossible with God, whether it's a back problem or whether it's a fibromyalgia or whatever nasty thing you may have had in your body. God can and will do it. With Him, nothing is impossible. So Terry and I are going to join hands. We're going to believe God for you. And all we say is, would you please believe God with us? And will you accept what He's going to do for you today? Father, I join with my sister in Christ. We believe God. We testify that we believe in your power. We've seen it time and time and time again where you reached out and touched people in the name of Jesus. Somebody has, uh, it's like a twisted intestine. It's like a, a blockage and, and they're, they're afraid of gangrene. And uh, this thing is going to do a miracle right now, and it's going to open up and release, and everything is going to be absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry. Someone else, you have a condition in your throat. I'm really not sure what it is or how long you've had it, but it, 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 when you swallow, it's like razor blades in your throat. It is so painful. It makes it difficult to eat. God's healing that for you right now. You're going to feel a warmth there. Just receive it. A woman has a sloughing in her left breast, and... Uh, it is malignant, and God, right now, you'll feel like, like heat just powering through, and you are completely whole, mm. Terry. And someone else with intestinal issues, you've had it your whole life. You, God's healing you today. Just receive it. Thank you, Lord. Oh, there's so much fighting. That there, there, there are families that are, that are fighting each other. And, and Paul, Mary, 
you're fighting, and God is going to give you harmony at home. All of a sudden, peace is going to come in. There will be forgiveness, and there will be love, and there will be harmony, because the Lord is a God of peace, and He's a God of love, and a God of righteousness. Mm -hmm. In the name of Jesus, we speak peace on troubled families all over this audience, in yes. Jesus' name. And someone else, yeah. you've been in an accident, you have a broken femur, and there's a, an mm. infection there, but God is Thank healing you. that and clearing it for you as we speak. You're going to be perfectly whole. Praise God. Thank and once you. again, we pray for this nation. Oh, God, as we come into the last few days of a great election, Lord, have your will in this land, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Mm -hmm. If you have further need for prayer, we've got people at the telephone. It's real simple. Man, we've got a new number. We've got a guy that is so smart, and he, he went out and found people who are brokers who have numbers, and we got <laughs> 707. We got a good one. <laughs> we got a very good one, 707,000. It's easy to remember. And you can dial us 800, of course, puts you into the toll free. Uh, it's toll free, it doesn't cost anything. Terry? Well, still ahead, it's a story of three lives and one global call. One filmmaker takes us inside the new documentary, Lost Kites. That's next. Welcome back to the 700 Club. An American Christian aid worker was kidnapped Saturday while on a ministry trip in Niger, Africa. Authorities say gunmen raided Jeff Woodkey's home, killing his two guards and sparking panic. He's known for working with YWAM, teaching the residents how to read and spreading the gospel. Al Qaeda and criminal gangs frequently target Westerners in the area and demand millions of dollars for their release. A three-judge panel on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld a California law forcing pro-life pregnancy centers to promote abortion. Under the law, pro-life centers must direct their clients to abortion clinics in the area. Critics say the measure is a clear violation of freedom of speech. And Christian leader and psychologist Dr. James Dobson is calling for civil disobedience against the law. He says, I have a simple word of advice to those pastors, priests, and others who run California's crisis pregnancy centers. If California attempts to enforce this law, then do not comply. Make them put you in jail. Other courts in Texas, Maryland, and New York have struck down similar laws. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, across the world, there are 8 to 10 million children living in orphanages and more than 10 times that living on the streets. That's why a group of young filmmakers spent two years putting together a documentary. They wanted to show what life is like for the modern day orphan and help get them into the families they need and deserve. I see children like I see kites rippling colorfully and tethered by a fine line of guidance. Joining us now is the screenwriter for Lost Kites and the head of research and writing for Global Breakthrough, Casey Walker. Casey, it's great to have you with us. Hi, thank you. Talk a little bit about Global Breakthrough and also what the inspiration behind Lost Kites was all about. Yeah, well, Global Breakthrough is kind of my first start at looking at um, how we can pray and see how God can work through practical ways of helping mm -hmm. children. Um, and that's what led me to Youth with a Mission. 
and they are the ones that I work directly to make the film with. And what do you, when people see lost kites, because we're going to tell them how they can do that in, in just a few minutes, but what do you want them to come away with? What's the inspiration mm. behind it? Uh, my biggest takeaway from making this film was that there's hope that family restoration can happen all over the globe, that children actually can be with family. They don't have to be in an orphanage. Yeah. That's not the only answer. And it was, for me, it was the more countries I traveled to, the more hope I had that actually God can do this and that we can be a part of it. Yeah, there's actually a huge movement toward that now. I mean, we first met at World Without Orphans in Thailand some time ago where, where we all watched this film. And, um, you know, it's, there is a movement toward putting children in families or family settings. How would you say orphanages today differ from the kind of orphanages we might have in our mind that existed even 10, 20 years ago? Sure. So um, a lot of what we saw is that the majority of the children within the orphanages actually have a mom or a dad. I think the, the global statistic right now is 86% have a mom or a dad. So we would go to all these orphanages and we'd say, okay, if, if you have a mom or a dad, why aren't why you are with you them? Yeah. And then we started to uncover that poverty is the number one reason. It's a lot of single moms mm -hmm. and they show up at the orphanage step and just say, I can't take care of my child, could you? And so now we're, we're looking at a change, a shift from one person taking care of many children to social workers helping those families stay together mm -hmm. and stay on their feet and be able to keep their children. You in Lost Kites follow three children through a, a series of, of time, a period of time. Talk a little bit about each of them. Sunjoy, who is he and why him? Oh, yeah. Um, so Sanjoy, he was a street boy in India and he was so unique in that he was actually saving money, which is very rare for a street child. The money gets cut out of your pocket at night yeah. if you try and save it. He set up a money saving system in different day centers for children. And his goal was to get off the street. He wanted to start up a small business. Um, in the middle of filming, he ended up running away from us. And it began it began this search for Sanjoy in the midst of so many people in India, you can imagine. It's a sea. <laughs> it's a sea. And the fact that no one, he was accountable to no one. Normally when you, you know, with a child, the teacher knows where they are, the mom knows where they are. He's 15. So he didn't look 15, but, but no. even so 15 having had had no parenting prior to this is right. younger than 15. And he'd been on the street for a long yeah. time. So um, that was that was Sanjoy's story. And Warwick, um, he's a 17 year old in Brazil and he was living in an orphanage. When he's 18, he knew he'd have to graduate out and do something with his life. So Warwick, one option was to continue working at the factory that he was at. The other option, um, He's really good at soccer. Mm -hmm. And you know how Brazil is so big on yes. soccer? So the professional city team invited him to come try out. So wow. for Warwick, this was you know the chance at his mm -hmm. dream. And his goal was to make the team and get his brother out of the orphanage as well. Yeah. So we followed him through training and trying out. Yeah. And um, our last child, Carmela, the joy of my heart. Um, <laughs> she's a two and a half year old in China. And she was abandoned as a baby. She had a hole in her heart left at the hospital, mm -hmm. local Christian foster parents took her in and they didn't have enough money for her surgery. The surgery in itself would be an experiment. So they were trying to find a hospital that could um, really take care of her needs and also that they could afford it. So yeah. they really laid everything on the line for her life. They were willing to sell their house, sell their car, anything to get Carmela, their foster child, into surgery. And to some degree, that's really the story that needs to occur for all children, isn't it? For someone to step up and be willing to sacrificially love and go and do you know, what? how can people help? Because this whole concept of putting children in families isn't something new that people thought of. It's a God idea. I mean, yeah. he says, I put the lonely in families because family is how we grow up and mature and become. So what can people do to help foster, if I could use sure, that word, yeah. this whole idea of children belong in families. Sure. So of course there's international adoption, domestic, foster care is wonderful. Something that um, everyone can do 
um, is to sponsor a child internationally. Mm -hmm. um, one organization we work with is Compassion International, and we love the work that they do. The child actually stays in their family, and it goes through the local church um, with the pastor, and they get to grow up in the Lord, get an education, get their medication yeah. taken care of, anything they need. And um, so you pay a small monthly amount. You can write letters to your child, mm -hmm. encourage them in the Lord from overseas. Yeah and um, just see them really blossom in their community and with their family. Well, it's an inspiring, inspiring film, and we thank you for your hard work. You all went to 22 countries along the way in the yeah. process. God yes. is good. <laughs> he surely is, he surely is. We thank you for being with us today, Casey. I wanna tell all of you that the docu documentary is called Lost Kites, and it's one that has the endorsement of Orphan's Promise, where CBN's arm extended to orphaned and vulnerable children around the world, and we believe in this entire concept as well, that children belong in families, even orphanages that have family-like settings. But if you'd like to see how you can watch that film or set up a screening in your area even, go to CBN.com. This is an idea that's time has come, and we need you to help us promote that. Casey, thank you so much for your thank work you. and your team. Well, coming up, we've got your email questions. Carolyn says, I think my husband cheated, but he said they didn't sleep together. Is this still adultery? We're going to let Pat weigh in on that one and more when we bring it on, and it's coming up next. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. Time to bring it on with your email questions. And Pat, this first one comes from Carolyn, Caroline, who says, I got married to a guy who constantly cheated. I stayed for our son. I broke up with him after five years and then got back with him two years later thinking he had changed. We remarried. Now I find out he cheated after three years of marriage, even though they say they didn't have sex. Is it adultery if he spent time with another woman but didn't have sex? Can I leave him? My trust is gone. Um, I think you were sort of foolish to get remarried to somebody who was a serial adulterer, and I dare say that he's done the same thing. Um, the trust is gone. The marriage bond has been broken, and uh, I think as far as the Bible, I, I would say you're free to leave. You, you don't have to stay in a relationship like that. And, yeah, that's I mean, it. He, he's he's going to philander. That's that's his nature, and. Uh, if if you think that's good for you, well, by all means, <laughs> hang around. But I I, I think. You'd be better off to be free. Yeah, well, there's a son involved, too, so yeah, you need well, to be careful what you expose him to, right. you know. Exactly. Okay. This is David, Pat, who says, I read on the Internet that the church Jesus was talking about actually meant congregation or assembly of believers and not a building. Also, in the Old Testament, God said he doesn't live in man-made buildings, so why should we go to a building every Sunday? Well, you don't have to go to a building every Sunday, but the Bible says don't forsake assembling yourself together. The word in Greek is ekklesia, which means the called out ones, and the called out ones uh, were in a, in, a, in a community. They would ring the bell and call out an assembly of the people that come together in the ecclesia, and that's the church. The church is not a building. You're exactly right. It's the body of believers. But going to a building is not what God talks about. What he talks about is get together with those who love the Lord. Mm -hmm. Don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. So the term, the, the one that's called the assemblies of God, probably may be closer to it, mm -hmm. all right? This is a viewer who says, I feel like when I'm in the will of God, I remain confident. But once I fall into sexual sin, that joy and confidence in myself goes away. I know I'm nothing without Jesus, and I know that we're saved by grace through faith and not by our works. But through the years, I've let God down many, many times. I just want to be a good Christian. I know I'm accepted in the beloved, but I feel separated and sad when I don't please God. Please help. How should I go about handling this? All right. Uh, David prayed. You remember he uh, had uh, sex with uh, uh, Bathsheba, and they had a child, and he killed her husband, yeah. and it was bad stuff. So he says in the psalm, he said, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. You will not have joy if you live in sin. So you say you fall into secular sin. Ask the Lord to forgive you. He'll do it. Ask him to cleanse you. He'll do it. And then begin to walk in the liberty of the children of God. I wish we had longer, but that's it. We leave you with today's Power Minute. 
The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.